we come for a break. I'm now going to introduce our second guest speaker of the day, Roddy Zorak. Roddy first became involved with the disability movement in 1990, while still, still living in Glasgow. A long-standing socialist and trade union activist, he works in higher education and is a member of the Disabled Members Standing Committee with the University and Colleges Union. Roddy is currently writing a book on the history and politics of disability. So I'm going to hand over to Roddy. So Roddy, welcome. Thanks very much, Paula. Um, okay, I want to try and make sure there's not too much duplication, so I'm changed a little bit as, um, as Neil was talking and to make sure also that uh, I'm not covering ground that Richard's going to cover as well. So what I want to try and do is keep this fairly narrow if you like. Um, so I'm not going to be able to talk about war in general because I think Neil made it perfectly plain that war is not about um, you know, uh, peace and civilization and democracy at all. It's always about carving up the world between uh, sets of different rulers and so on. It's always not about peace and democracy at all, but about terrible violence and barbarism. And um, what I want to try and concentrate on really is um, the notion of uh, disabled war veterans as a, as a deserving or more deserving or less deserving than anyone else. And uh, the, if you like, two different traditions uh, of uh, disabled war veterans that you can point to. And what I want to try and do is just concentrate on one of them. If you like, one image, one tradition has been that that you might epitomise by the American Legion or the Royal British Legion, which is really about glorifying war, memorialising in order to glorify, in order to justify current wars. In fact, and um, Neil, I think, has uh, um, given, given a very good indication of that right at the beginning of this talk, so I'm not, again, going to repeat that. But if you go right back in history, you can see that there's always been a close relationship between the development of notions of disability and the question of war itself. Now, I'm not going to go all the way back, largely because I don't know much, um, but what I do want to try and concentrate on is uh, the, 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 the 20th century, for obvious reasons, because the vast majority of people that have died in war died during the 20th century. It was absolutely by far and away the most barbaric century uh, that we've seen in history. But the reason for this cartoon is that, um, going right back to the French Revolution, you start to see the development of different traditions. You start to see the development of people beginning to articulate a struggle for themselves and for social justice as a consequence of sacrifice made in war. And here you have uh, two veterans um, at the house of a very posh French aristocrat looking for their pensions, looking for um, some recompense for the damage and the injuries that were done to them in war. And um, in, in the French Revolution in 1789, there was the first real sort of medical hospital for veterans set up a place called Hôpital des Invalides in uh, Paris. And uh, that very quickly uh, after the revolution became a centre for radicalism and organising uh, by, by, by uh, veterans of the Revolutionary War. And they um, very quickly actually became a, a centre of intrigue and um, controversy in the middle of Paris because of their very radical traditions. In other words, their support for, if you like, the bottom-up notion of the revolution, that change should be something that affects everybody, that liberty, equality and fraternity should be for everyone and not for uh, you know, the, you know, the Girondins who eventually came to dominate the revolution and, uh, and in fact uh, <coughs> destroyed the uh, Hôpital des Invalides. So the kind of uh, changes they had made, like more egalitarian pensions, proper provision, proper diet, um, much more sophisticated um, uh, facilities in Hôpital des Invalides, uh, they, were, they were wiped out uh, by the rise of Napoleon and the end of the revolution. And um, somebody referred earlier to um, you know, the attitude of, uh, of, of the rich towards, um, towards uh, disabled veterans. Well, even back then, the, um, a few years after the end of the Napoleonic Wars in 1824, uh, the British army disbanded very large numbers of its troops. And uh, within a few years, they realised that this was creating social problems, and they brought in uh, something called the Vagrancy Act in 1824, which was quite specifically directed against homeless soldiers who had no pensions, no support whatsoever from the government afterwards. So if you like, that's really the kind of tradition that I'm going to concentrate on. That tradition of fighting for social justice and so forth. 
um, uh, afterwards. Now, um, Neil referred to uh, poor little Belgium and the argument about um, you know uh, the the Hun, um, you know hoisting up the you know babies on bayonets. Well, here's a cartoon that shows precisely that um, during the First World War. This kind of justification for war, and you have this terrible cartoon of the Hun there, you know eating eating uh, people and so on. So you know this is the kind of basis upon which wars have always been justified. <coughs> You have to demonise your enemy, you have to make them worse and less than human in order to justify um, war. But the thing about it is, and again this comes back to something that Neil referred to, the period running up to the First World War in Britain was one where you really started to get a ramping up of uh, disability discrimination, something called eugenics, uh, which was supported by even people like Winston Churchill, people like William Beveridge, the founder of a welfare state, but more importantly, the rich industrialists and so on who dominated British society at that time, and they really argued that you know society should be about survival of the fittest, and that there really shouldn't be social support, uh, social facilities made available for disabled people who should be braided out of existence. And this is what you see with the rise of eugenics, um, which I'll come back to a little later. But really, there are sort of notions of the fear of a degenerate race, as they called it. Um, came into very sharp relief uh, during preparations for the Boer War in South Africa when it was found that most of the people that were going to be in the British Army were in fact, um, were in, fact uh, uh, in a very poor state of physical health. And so this is a run up you see to the, to the beginnings of the First World War. And uh, Neil's referred to the, the, the scale that that took place on and so on, industrialised warfare. Here you see a battlefield that's been completely and utterly scarred by war. Um, over half the three million British troops that fought uh, in, the, in, in the war were deafened, blinded, lost limbs, or were very badly um, disfigured. And when large numbers of uh, wounded men began coming back for the Western Front, really all the kind of medical services that existed were completely and utterly overwhelmed, very quickly. And so you had the new Queen Mary's Hospital established at Roehampton, a hospital that was really dedicated to fitting artificial limbs. Uh, on a massive scale really. And, um, however, what I want to concentrate on just for five minutes is uh, shell shock. Because shell shock, although it was really the minority, if you like, of injuries in the war, it wasn't by, by a long shot the kind of uh, you know, uh, mass, um, mass injuries like you see with, de with, with amputated limbs and so on. Nevertheless, it assumes a huge degree of political importance uh, for reasons which I want to dwell on very briefly. Because um, it, it sort of symbolised, if you like, the notion of senseless slaughter. People dramatised by a war that, you know, although everybody supported right at the beginning it seemed, by the end of the war you could find very few people that had uh, actually uh, supported the war. Suddenly nobody seemed to be um, uh, advocating that the war was a good thing anymore. And uh, that was because really what happened during the war was a kind of industrialised warfare and slaughter that Neil explained so very well. But what I want to say is that you know, if you look at the books and um, literature and films on the First World War, in fact the film Regeneration was on the television very recently, Pat Barker's brilliant trilogy of books about the war. Um, in that you see the treatment of officers diagnosed as suffering from what was called neurasthenia at the time or nervous collapse. Uh, and they were allocated private rooms and tranquil country houses like happens in the, the, the film Regeneration where you see the sort of therapy handed out to, uh, handed out to the, 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 the main characters there. But the, the same symptoms um, and the rights were interpreted as a lack of moral fibre, and that was really something that was completed completely differently. The eugenicists that I referred to earlier, they argued that shell shock really proved the sort of physical and mental uh, degeneration of, of working people, so that those in the ranks were really treated very differently uh, to the officers. They were sent to traditional field hospitals, usually to die of disease or infection, because you know medical advances at that time were way behind what we have now. Uh, and a small number were sent to asylum. Sometimes they were the lucky ones though, because the generals believing that shell shock really amounted to cowardice or malingering, they believed that uh, what they needed was some stiff military discipline. And uh, so 
methods like electroshock and very harsh uh, military discipline were tried to be used to get people back to the front and uh, other, other people were actually executed by firing squad. In fact, the uh, British Army executed 306 people um, uh, for cowardice or desertion. Many of them were shell-shocked, traumatised war victims and uh, they were given really absolutely no rights whatsoever in the courts martial that took place. In fact, it was very much like at home where you got the, you know, the plum-voiced uh, generals and uh, officers uh, from very rich and wealthy backgrounds, like the magistrates' courts at home, where the, the poor and the serfs would be dragged in and, uh, and treated to some of the justice. Exactly the same thing happened in, in uh, the courts martial, where the accused really had no right whatsoever to legal representation. In fact, only three out of the 306 people shot were officers, all of them without connections uh, to, to, uh, to, 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 to the rich and so on. In fact, there's one thing in terms of what Neil says, and he's an absolutely brilliant pamphlet, which I really recommend you buy on the First World War. He says that all the people memorialised were treated equally in terms of the, you know, whether they were won medals or whatever. That's not quite true, because none of the people, none of the 306 that were executed appear on war memorials today, even though there was an amnesty granted in 2008 under the Labour government. Actually, nothing as further has happened in terms of recognition for the sacrifices that these people made. I just want to go on a little bit to, um, the reason that this slide uh, exists here is that it's one of the few pictures of somebody we know who led a rebellion in the British Army against the war. His name's Percy Topless, who was the subject of a brilliant book and uh, TV drama series which you can get in DVD, it's called The Monocle Mutineer, an absolutely brilliant uh, drama series about you know, the, 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 the revolts that took place in the First World War amongst the British Army. There's very little recorded history about that. It was a smaller scale version of the mutinies that took place in the French Army. And then of course, much more famously, the revolutionary uprisings in Russia and later in the German Army and in the Italian armies that really ended the war completely and utterly. You know, the notion that the war was ended through military means is actually rubbish. The war ended as a consequence of revolution and mutinies and uh, the armed forces across, across Europe. And that's really how, how it happened. Even by November 1917, at the time of the outbreak of the Russian Revolution, uh, the armed forces commander, Errol Haig, uh, worried about what he called advanced socialistic and even anarchical views in the ranks. And he had a whole series of um, incidents and um, discharged soldiers and sailors demonstrated at the Elder Hall in March 1918. There was a mass rally of wounded ex-soldiers later that month. There was huge labour unrest right throughout 1919, which I really don't have time to go into. But suffice to say that the armistice days that took place after the First World War for several years were disrupted by disabled veterans who were incredibly angry at the way that the war was being memorialised and no respect whatsoever was being paid to them, no recompense, no recognition of uh, the sacrifices that they'd made uh, for, the, for the arms dealers and so on, and whose name really the war, frankly, was fought for any of you that have seen, you know, oh what a lovely war and so on. But the treatment of most shell shock uh, victims really epitomised for millions of people the kind of cruelty of, uh, of, of the British establishment, the trauma of what was called a lost generation. And what really happened was that the eugenic ideas went into very sharp decline after the end of the First World War because you had this rise of a feeling of social disenfranchisement, a lack of social justice and so on. And uh, really th 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 that's one of the things that happened. So, the opposite really starts to happen in Germany, but that only starts to develop later, after the defeat of uh, the German Revolution, which is the subject of the next slide here. Because the war ended because of uh, the, 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 the Russian soldiers en masse <coughs> refusing to fight anymore and turning their arms, in fact, on their officers. And then a huge uprising uh, in the German armed forces, primarily in the Navy and Kiel, first of all, and that led to five years of revolutionary upheaval. And the German dis the, the, the thing about the German Revolution is the degree to which disabled veterans played quite a central role in it is quite remarkable. The German Labour Ministry estimated that by 1921, the seven different organisations of disabled veterans had nearly 1.4 million members amongst them, which is quite incredible. 
Um, there's a whole lot of news reports I could refer to, and so I've shown you the role of people. But one Berlin psychiatrist diagnosed that the revolution, or quote, by inverting the social system, had removed the social function of neurosis, in other words, war trauma. And that's a really good way of putting it, because what he's really saying is, once people knew they didn't have to go back to war, then the self shock symptoms and the trauma, the, the, you know, as you can imagine, disappeared. <laughs> because as, uh, as people said, you know, there's no need for me, the war for me is over. And that led to a very rapid uh, improvement in the conditions of a whole number of veterans. I'm going to... Um, I'm going to uh, just put this slide up. I'm not going to go into it much because I think it's a wee bit off the subject. But suffice to say that the, the period in Weimar where you see initial gains by the Weimar government as a result of the pressure from the trade unions, from the national revolutionary movement, from the veterans, you see a whole number of social welfare changes brought in. Most importantly, the most progressive piece of legislation probably ever that's been brought through for disabled people, the law of the severely disabled. The law of the severely disabled actually introduced, as it wasn't introduced in Britain, compulsory legislation, um, making sure that industrialists employed a certain number of people amongst the workforce had to be disabled. And that wasn't just war veterans. As a consequence of the pressure from the left and the revolutionary movement, um, that applied to everybody. If they were injured in the factories, they were born disabled or whatever, it didn't matter. It was actually about everybody who was disabled who got equal provision. And that's very, very important. Uh, from the point of view of uh, really the history of the uh, disability movement and so on. Um, really just to refer to this as I say really when you start to see the rise of the Nazis they on the one hand promoted disabled veterans as representing the sacrifice of the fatherland and all the rest of it but actually at the same time you start to develop uh, the ideas of, uh, the, uh, of disabled people as economic burdens, as useless eaters and so you have sections of disabled people being promoted as examples of the fatherland sacrifice and at the same time actually plans being prepared to, to sterilise uh, disabled people and ultimately to send them to the gas chambers. In advance of the Jews actually, the gas chambers were tried out on disabled people um, before, they were, before they were tried out on, uh, before they were, they were used on, on, on the Jewish people. Um, Richard's really referred to most of what I was going to refer to about the post-war settlement in Britain, so I'm not really going to dwell on that, but if you think about Remploy recently, the subject of the cuts by the government two years ago, the Remploy factories were brought about as a consequence of the protests that Richard referred to, the Blind People's March in 1920 and 1936. They were originally called their mega, their mega workshops, and they were actually formally developed as a, a, a network of uh, sheltered, uh, sheltered uh, workshops when they were taken over by the government uh, as part of the 1944 Disabled Persons Act and the National Assistance Act four years later. So the development of the welfare state really comes from the kind of examples that you can read about in the Second World War, where just prior to D-Day, Churchill goes over to Portsmouth and he meets a whole bunch of, uh, of people that are about to go and fight and probably die in D-Day landings. And one of them says to him, is this really going to be worth it this time? All the sacrifices we made in the last war, are we going to see a real change? And there was this huge pressure for the war to be about something, not just to defeat Nazism, but to be a war that represented a fight for something better and so on. And that's really what leads to the foundation of the welfare state after the war. It's nothing to do with you know, people being nice to us or handing down you know, reforms to us in a plate. It's about the fear they had that the Second World War was going to end in the same way as the First World War had ended. And that's why that example, that little example where Churchill feels, oh my God, it looks like we really are going to have to make some changes, um, it represents really. Just a reference to the Cold War, because the United States and uh, the Soviet Union really had exactly the same kind of attitude to their disabled veterans. Because war and militarism was so central to the Cold War, they gave privileges to disabled veterans of the Second World War, so they got things like free cars, free apartments, free public transport, um, uh, uh, loans and free medical care in America. Of course, medical care was free in the Soviet Union, but you had a whole series of privileges, if you like, awarded to them. I think you're going to refer to this later, aren't you? So I'll just slide over that immediately and forget about that completely. But the point really is, is that um, you see very large-scale changes in terms of how wars have been fought. Um, the figure I have for the number of deaths during the 20th century comes from 
uh, Eric Hobsbawm, the historian, uh, that was uh, estimated 187 million people died during the 20th century. But you know the figures are, you know, might be a bit here and there, but you get some idea of the sheer scale of the slaughter that took place, and the equivalent of only of over 10 percent of the world's population in 1913. That gives you some idea of the proportion we're talking about. Again, Richard will probably refer to this more later, but. 5% of those that died in World War I were civilians. By the time you get to today's kind of wars, it's really 80 to 90% of the people that die in war that are civilians, which is you know, quite remarkable. So in Iraq and Afghanistan and so on, the hundreds of thousands of people that are died are largely civilians. I've got nothing to do with the war, actually. And another aspect that you see in change in the war, because Richard, um, sorry, um, Neil referred to reification and uh, you know, the, the, the sort of way in which is an attempt to divorce the ordinary people that are part of wars from the consequences of their actions. Today's drone wars, you know, where you have people operating um, on this video game for killing technology from thousands of miles away that are actually dropping bombs on people in weddings and so on in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, you know, this sort of idea that you're completely divorced from the war it doesn't turn out that this is actually the case because people involved in these things, sometimes because you're so far removed from what you're doing, actually creates more trauma in the back of people's heads. So you still get what you might call post-traumatic stress disorder of people seeing these kind of grainy videos of an explosion. You know that people in that grainy video are being, are being killed and so on. So we have really... I think the evolution, and some of them trying to research more really, but the degree to which um, disabled veterans are subjected to huge mental trauma and trying to deal with the effect of, of wars which they no longer believe in. And this is really the important thing about the post-war period after the Second World War. You have more and more and more of a sense that the wars that people have been involved in are not wars that they have a stake in. Not wars that benefit or for the advancement of society, but for the protection or the interests of you know, the oil companies or whatever, if you talk about Iraq, to take the obvious example. But really the turning point comes with the Vietnam War. Because the Vietnam War, you see disabled war veterans specifically identifying with social wider <coughs> questions um, and becoming involved in the, in the fight for, 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 for civil rights, against racism, for gay rights. Um, and so on. And so many former veterans in the United States today are part of the anti-war movement. In fact, one of the most famous of them, a guy called Thomas Young, he just died on the 10th of November. Thomas was the subject of a, a brilliant documentary um, called Body of War, made in 2007. And it's interesting to compare Thomas Young with the other most famous uh, American disabled war veteran, Ron Kovic. Because when Ron Kovic went to war in Vietnam, he really believed that what he was fighting for was justified. He believed in the stars and stripes. He believed in, you know, apple pie and, you know, um, you know uh, basically that America is the font and centre of democracy and progress and so on. The experience of the war, the experience in the military hospitals afterwards, radicalises him and he comes back to a society that wants to forget about the war, wants to forget about the disabled veterans that fought it, and often, often um, you know, stigmatizes them, and so on. So he's radicalized by that process. Well, so is Thomas Young. The difference is that Thomas Young went to war not really believing in it in the first place. And I think that this is the thing about it today. You, know, you look at support for wars in Syria or whatever today, it might be the case that that support starts off to be quite broad, but I believe it really is also very shallow. And I think that it's quite possible that the kind of huge movement that we saw, um, you know, uh, 11 years ago against the Iraq war, when two, 30 million people marched across the world, I don't believe that that number of people has gone, I don't believe that anti-war sentiment has gone, I don't believe that all these wonderful traditions that were established, international traditions, bringing together of all the social justice campaigns as a part of it, the involvement of disabled people in these campaigns. I don't believe that's gone away, and I think it's very, very much something that we need to fight for and preserve for the future. Right. Does anybody have any questions or comments or any thoughts they'd like to put to Ronnie? I would 
wonder whether there's, there's more to be done in terms of common cause between the sort of disabled people's movement and, and veterans. I, I know that some, co some connections are being made, but I suppose because disabled people's movements are, are t tend to be anti-war, and, and mm. veterans, of course, for whatever reason, have, have been through combat and, and whatever, it, it, it tends to be a bit of a standoff, and I just wonder whether you've got any thoughts around how we can make that common cause more. Do you want to take a few and then yeah. I'll come back later, maybe? Yeah. Anyone else? Any thoughts or questions? Uh, you mentioned that after the uh, First World War, I think it was, the demise of eugenics. Yes. And uh, I'm particularly toying with that idea. Is that I would You're toying with the idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, about, about the notion that it has, in fact, demised. Uh, but it, it's resurfaced surfaced in other forms. I did. Yeah. So uh, I just wondered whether you could clarify that because I, mean, I wouldn't certainly want to think that it's just gone. Yeah. Richard, do you have that? Yeah, I mean, I think the, it's one of the things that I wrote about in the pamphlet for this was this month was the. Uh, upsurge of American uh, soldiers, uh, veterans, uh, when the promises made to them were not upheld in the 1930s, which actually was what, what led to this better deal for veterans in America in the Second World War. Because what happened then was that the, America entered the First World War late, not until the end of 1916, there weren't hardly any troops on the ground until the middle of 1917. And, uh, but there was a huge mobilisation of, of <coughs> capital in terms of industrial output and sending many munitions over to Europe long before the trained men came. And this meant that there was an industrial boom and wages went very high and the soldiers, the state couldn't afford or wouldn't afford to pay them the same rate, so they were paid about 10% of the industrial wage. And so a promise was made to them all that they would get a bonus, but the bonus would be deferred uh, for 20 years. I don't know if they hoped that most of them would die, or what was the reason. But anyway, when the crash happened in 1929, there became a huge grassroots mobilization across all of the states for the bonus. And there was a march on Washington, and there was the laying siege of the Capitol building. And uh, these guys didn't just come for a one-day demo, which is maybe a lesson to us, but they stayed there and camped for six months. Uh, but a, a, the man in charge of security in Washington was a man called General MacArthur, who we come across later on, uh, who left the Philippines and said, I will return and all of that. But at that time, he persuaded the then president that this was a threat on the state, and these were all Bolsheviks, and they were about to overthrow the state. Actually, what they wanted was the... Uh, government to, to live up to its promise and bring the bonus forward as they couldn't afford to live. And about a third of those uh, demonstrating and camping there were disabled veterans. Uh, and so in a way it was a, a large outpouring and part of our movement in a way. Uh, so he attacked this uh, camp, encampment. Two were killed and many, many injured with charges. And then they were forcibly de redeployed to other parts of the United States to get them out of the Capitol building. And one such group was put into a camp in Florida where when the hurricane struck, 300 of them were killed. So there was a lot of blood on the hands. And when Roosevelt, as a disabled person himself, became president, one of his first planks was that he would actually honour the bonus. And he, it was he who set up the, the Veterans Administration and what went on. So, even that, it wasn't just fear, but it was a, a reaction to a demonstration by, by disabled people and their supporters who also benefited from it. So I just thought that would round out the picture of what you were talking about, Roddy. You may have some comments. Anyone else got any comments or thoughts or questions for Roddy while he's here? Okay. Shall I um, come back to the to these uh, points? Um, 
I just I think the, the thing about common cause between the disability movement and veterans is um, something that I think is a perennial kind of obstacle and difficulty. Um, and I think that part of it is about, if you like, the mentality of military training and how you know you're turned into a military machine, a killing machine, frankly. Um, and you're really separated and your identity uh, as a civilian, if you like, a part of lay society is systematically obliterated. If you watch films like Full Metal Jacket and a whole number of other films, they are very, very good at getting this across. Uh, and the dehumanisation, in other words, of, 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 of people in the armed forces and the degree to which the identity of the common people that after all they're trying to slaughter elsewhere in other countries is something that uh, has, to, has to be undermined. So the thing therefore is, is that when people break from that, they can break in a number of different directions. Um, and sometimes it's really about saying that um, I'm not at all disabled, you know, that I'm, I'm just somebody who doesn't have a leg or whatever. So uh, that, that, that's incredibly powerful you know, a physically fit person and so on. And this is something that's very, very much promoted in the Paralympics, for example. In Canada, <coughs> only 2% of the British um, Paralympic team were veterans. But looking at the press coverage, you think it was, you know, 90% in terms of the promotion of uh, different individuals and so on. But this is something that's very, very important to the military because this is why you see the promotion of wounded warriors and so on, the Invictus Games that's promoted by the royalty and so on. It's ideologically, if you like, very, very important um, to get across the notion of rehabilitation as something that's about, quite literally, even if you can't do it literally, pull your socks up and uh, you know, get on with it kind of thing. And therefore, really against the notion of social provision and much more about the sense of we have to rehabilitate the individual and get them fit for getting back into society and so on. So that's why if you like someone like Ludwig Gutmann is such a, such a contradictory figure. Ludwig Gutmann was a, a Jewish um, doctor who fled Nazi Germany and founded the Stoke Mandeville Hospital which then became the foundation for what became the Paralympic Games later. And Ludwig Gutmann's attitude, Michael Oliver talks about this because he was at Stoke Mandeville Hospital, was really on the sense of, you know, you're, you, you know, not to be ashamed of yourself, but to be proud and to be an individual and to make, and not to be a drain on the public purse, but to be uh, somebody who's productive in society and so on. And that was very much his emphasis. And so I think that what we're really trying to get across is there's a whole number of different threads of military life and military psychology, if you like, that can be an obstacle to doing that. But it's when you see much wider scale social change that you also see these ideas being more widely questioned. So that's why I think that you, the periods where you see the biggest disenfranchisement, if you, the, the, the biggest disillusionment of veterans is when you see these wider scale movements. So you saw it at the end of the First World War, you saw it uh, during the Vietnam War and its aftermath, during the whole period of the 60s, radicalisation in a whole number of different fields and so on. And you saw it again with the, the movement against the Iraq War, and um, I think to some degree at the moment, where there are different organisations of disabled veterans, particularly in the States, um, that, are, that, that are really beginning to try and make these kind of links with the wider movement in the way that Ron Kovic did after, after the Vietnam War. So I, I hope that sort of answers your question. Um, on the issue of eugenics, I think that it's absolutely true that there's much more to say about this issue because eugenics was really became popular in Germany as a consequence not of uh, Britain taking it up initially because it went straight across the Atlantic to America and uh, by the period of, uh, of the 1930s, you had a whole series of American states that had laws to sterilize disabled people and, uh, and not allow them to have children. Uh, and this was something that was entirely legal in the United States. And I think it was 30 states uh, by, by that period. I, I'm not sure about that figure I should have uh, taken it down. But anyway, uh, yeah, so I think it was 26, sorry. Uh, but anyway, the point I'm making is, is that um, you have this large-scale legitimization of the notion of a survival of the fittest in the world, in the society of which was at the center of uh, the world's biggest empire at that time. The rise, if you like, of American militarism coincides with this notion of the survival of the fittest and so on. 
And so all the kind of intellectual works and medical insights and so on start appearing in Germany. And that's the Germany who, and actually a whole number of Hitler's ministers, Hitler himself said, you know, we need what the Americans have got, they've got the right idea. And that was where their laws started to come from. And the justification, the ideological justification for the crimes that they then began to legitimise on a scale that never happened in America. Nevertheless, uh, the, that um, sterilisation programme continued in America right up till 1972. There's a last report I could find of it taking place in uh, California, in fact, the so-called progressive California. And um, the thing about what you said about it resurfacing today I think is very, very true. And I think that um, there are aspects of the argument made by the disability movement that I don't agree with. I don't agree that abortion amounts to, you know, um, um, the argument that, 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 that abortion rights should be extended any less to disabled people, or, or, or the argument that parents, you know, should not want to have kids and so on in a society that doesn't provide for disabled people. To me, either, you know, women have got the right to decide not to have uh, children or not. That's it really, I feel like, an absolute right. And I think that it's easy to muddy the waters over that. The second issue, however, is the issue of assisted dying. The issue of assisted dying is something that has come much more to the forefront, particularly in Japan recently. Um, two years ago, the Japan uh, the, the, the deputy prime minister in uh, Japan uh, said that basically disabled people should hurry up and die because it were a drain on the public purse. And remember, this at a time when the economy in Japan had been in recession for 10 years. So, you know, there's very much a link between the idea that a, a society under siege, if you like, a society ripped by austerity, is one in which the poor should pay the price of that austerity. And, uh, you know, obviously rich folk are always going to have resources and so on and so forth. You know, Stephen J. Hawking might be severely disabled, but he's also quite rich and he's got a whole team of, you know, personal assistants and new technology to draw on and so on in a way that lots of other disabled people actually don't. Um, so I think that it's very important to bring that into the picture. Um, there's just one last thing about, about FDR, because I'm sure you, Richard agrees with me anyway, but uh, Roosevelt had to be pressurised to support the, 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 the pensions uh, being, being, being paid. Uh, and he actually threatened a veto twice in his first administration and, and bringing, the, and bringing, into, and bringing the, the bonus into payment. And um, the... the the movement that you, that you saw in America during the 1930s really had very contradictory elements in it because uh, there was a statement made by one of its leaders that if, uh, if Roosevelt didn't grant the bonus then you were going to see a rise of a dictatorship just like you saw in Germany, which is you know, not necessarily a particularly progressive kind of observation in the way that it was made. But the point was that there was a real sense that American society was under threat because this was also a time where you started to see the development of huge trade union movements across America. 1934 and 1936, the huge union drives, the sit-in at Flint, Flint, Michigan, the Teamster Rebellion, and really you start to see the rise of the CIO and the industrial union. So this coinciding with the military veterans uh, upsurge was something that terrified uh, Roosevelt and these acolytes. And that's part of the reason, I think, why you start to see uh, these, uh, these benefits been brought in for disabled veterans after the Second World War. In other words, for very similar reasons that we've got the welfare state in Britain. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Roddy, for coming today. A great presentation. So thank you very much. Thanks very much for having me. Is it Kate? Is Kate here?